everybody it's me i am just going to do a book haul of all the books that i bought in october now um i didn't buy many obviously i haven't got a lot of money so well i have got a lot but they were like 20 most of them were 25 pence or 50 pence um from the charity shop depending on where i got them from uh there's one brand new book that was a little bit on the pricey side but that's okay so um, this is in no particular order. So the first one I've got is The Wizardry of Oz by Jay Scarthone and William Stillman. Basically, this book tells the story of the making of the film The Wizard of Oz, the 1939 classic starring Judy Garland, um, with photographs and documents uh, from it. So I see this one mentioned quite a lot on the Oz vlog on TikTok by Tori, and I thought I'd add it to my very small Wizard of Oz book collection in keeping with motion picture uh, books. Florence Lawrence, uh, The Biograph Girl, the first, America's First Movie Star by Kelly R. Brown. So I'll read the back. Florence Lawrence film's career began just as cinema was being born. She recognised the wonder and appeal of the fledgling industry and her early work with the Vitagraph company gained her a legion of fans and a reputation as a willing and hard-working actress. In 1908 she appeared uh, in Romeo and Juliet, America's very first screen Juliet. By 1909 she was working steadily for the Biograph studio, but just as Lawrence was the first movie star in the industry, she was also one of the first to be undone by it. Hindered by setbacks, grueling work schedules, self-imposed retirements, three marriages and repeatedly unsuccessful comeback attempts, Lawrence killed herself in 1938. This is the first full-length biography of Lawrence. Among the photo photographs of some never before published, a complete filmography of her entire career is provided. A summary chapter includes comments from various critics and historians addressing the lasting significance of Lawrence to the history of film. It is really, really good, really, really sad. Um, basically, it said she was the first one to be named by her name in the film industry on posters and in newspapers, because before that they were just known as the Biograph Girl or you know, the, the imp girl or the whatever the company was. They were known by the company name rather by the, their, their name and she was supposedly the very first one to be named. I bought Terry Pratchett's very first book. Well, actually, no, I was given it, actually. I won it in a giveaway on Facebook. Um, Carpet People by Terry Pratchett. Uh, in the beginning, there was nothing but endless flatness. Then came the carpet. That's the old story everyone knows and loves, even if they don't really believe it. But now the carpet is home to many different tribes and peoples and there's a new story in the making. The story of Frey sweeping a trail of destruction across the carpet. The story of power-hungry mules and of two Munrung brothers who set out on an adventure to end all adventures when their village is flattened. It's a story that will come to a terrible end if someone doesn't do something about it. If everyone doesn't do something about it. Uh, this is a hilarious fantasy co-written by Terry Pratchett, age 17, and Master Terry, storyteller Terry Pratchett, age 43. So yeah, nice one for the Pratchett collection. And I finally bought and read, and I'll tell, talk about it in the thing, is Little Women by Louisa May Alcott. I don't obviously need to tell you anything about this because I'm sure you've all read it. Now, let's have a look at the rest of the books. What have I got? I've got a Lee Child one here called Make Me. This is obviously a Jack Reacher novel. There are weird names all over the country. Why single out Mother's Rest in a nation with towns called Why and Why Not and Accent and Peculiar and Santa Claus and No Name? Jack Reacher has no place to go and all the time in the world to get there. So a remote railway stop on the prairie with the curious name of Mother's Rest seems perfect for an aimless one day stopover. He expects to find a lonely pioneer tombstone in a sea of nearly ripe wheat. But instead there is a woman waiting for a missing colleague, a cryptic note about 200 deaths and a small town full of silent watchful people. Reacher's one day stopover turns into an open ended quest leading to the most hidden reaches of the internet and right into the heart of darkness. I love Jack Reacher stories. So, I've got Welcome to Fairy Lane Market by Nicola May. Uh, although 33 year old Cara Moon loves her hometown of Hartmouth in Cornwall, she's always wondered if she should have left to follow her dream of studying floristry. But she couldn't bring herself to abandon her emotionally delicate single father and has worked on Fairy, Line, Fairy Lane's market flower store ever since leaving school. Then an anonymous postcard arrives along with a plane ticket to New York and there begins the first three trips of a lifetime during which Cara will learn important lessons about herself, her life and what she wants from it and perhaps find love along the way. 
So like I said, most of these are from the charity shop. In fact, they're all from charity shops, except for the Wizardry of Oz, which was second hand from Amazon. And obviously Florence Lawrence, one which I got on eBay. Um, Amy McCulloch, Breathless. Six strangers, one killer, and you might be next. Da -da -da. So, Six Rangers, One Killer. Journalist Cecily Wong, Cecily Wong is offered the chance of a lifetime to join an elite team on one of the world's tallest mountains, but from the start, things start to fall apart. An unexpected theft, a horrible accident, a terrifying note. There's murder on the mountain. Six Strangers set out, how many will return? Sounds interesting. I got, if I can get it out, Martina Cole, The Life. Ooh. The Bailey brothers are gangsters determined to make their mark on the world. Peter and Daniel are chalk and cheese in many ways, but together they are unstoppable. From the late 70s, they rule London's East End and it seems no one can touch them. It's never easy at the top though, and there's always someone waiting to take you down, sometimes even those closest to you. Daniel's wife, Lena, is determined to shield their daughter, Tanya, from the life. But when a terrible tragedy occurs, Tanya's eyes are open to their world, forcing her to make an irre irrevocable choice about her future. I love books. I buy more than I read. Um, then I've got MC Beaton, Death of an Addict. This is a Hamish Macbeth story. Are drugs responsible for a sighting of Nessie's long lost relative? Recovering addict Tommy Jarrett has just rented a chalet to check out reports of a sea monster near the village of Drim. But when he turns up dead, apparently from an overdose, Lockdubber, Lockdub Constable Hamish Macbeth, I apologise to all my Scottish friends, finds the lad's demise to be particularly fishy and not of the local salmon variety. Deciding to go undercover, Hamish infiltrates the illicit drug trade in nearby Strath Strathbane, but his scheme springs a leak when he teamed up with a tough Glaswegian detective inspector named Olivia Cheta. For the lanky lawman investigating drugs and sea monsters, it's time to sink or swim, and it would be equally dangerous to flounder or fall in love. There we go. Then we've got James Patterson and Gabrielle Charbonnet, uh, Sunday at Tiffany's. No idea. Jane was a sweet, funny, chubby seven-year-old, desperately seeking love from her self-obsessed mother, Vivienne, and a father who was wrapped in a new life with his beautiful young girlfriend. Jane's only friend was handsome, funny, 30-something Michael. He was different. No one else could see him or believe he existed beyond, beyond the rain realms of Jane's, excuse me, very creative imagination. The pair would talk from morning to night as Jane grew older, though, the time came for Michael to leave Jane's side, but Jane couldn't forget him. More than 20 years after Michael said goodbye, Jane catches a glimpse of that unforgotten face. Her heart pounding, she can't believe it's true. Could it really be Michael? This time, Michael isn't just a figment of her imagination, but will the path of true love be a smooth one, and will Jane get her ever happy ever after? I can't speak today. So, you know, this book call is very late because, you know, half term. Eat, pray, love. Bye. Elizabeth Gilbert, One Woman Search for Everything. I have no idea. I've seen this a lot on YouTube and TikTok and everywhere. So Elizabeth is in her 30s, settled in a large house with a husband who wants to start a family, but she doesn't want any of it. A bitter divorce and a rebound fling later, Elizabeth emerges battered yet determined to find what she's been missing. So begin her quest. In Rome, she indulges herself and gains nearly two stone. In India, she finds enlightenment through scrubbing temple floors. And finally in Bali, a toothless medicine man reveals a new path to peace, leaving her ready to love again. Hmm interesting I, I mean I've, I've seen it a lot so something interesting something different why not uh, next I've got this lie will kill you by Chelsea Pitcher uh, you were cordially invited to tell the truth or face the consequences one year ago there was a party at the party someone died until now no one has told the truth about what happened that night Tonight, the five survivors arrive at an isolated mansion expecting to compete in a contest with a $50,000 prize. Nobody questions the odd, rather exclusive invitation until it's too late. Five arrived, but not all can leave. Will the truth set them free or will their lies destroy them all? Sounds interesting. They all sound interesting, which is why I've got them. Oh, one more in this bag. Hooray! Charlotte Grey, this one was 50p. Uh, Sebastian Volks. So I've read Birdsong. Um, 
1942, Charlotte Grey, a young Scottish woman, heads for occupied France on her dual mission, officially to run an apparently simple errand for a British Special Operations Group and unofficially to search for her lover, an English airman missing in action. As the people in the small town of Lavrette prepare to meet their terrible destiny, the harrowing truth of what took place in the dark years is finally revealed. Sounds scare, interesting, sad. I think they made it into a movie, didn't they? Next bag, we have got The Twins by L.V. Matthew. You think you know your sister? Think again. Two sisters, an intense bond, a bitter rivalry. Margot is a solitary living nanny for an upper-class Kensington family. Cora is a dancer on the cusp of a big break, living hand-to-mouth in cramped London flat. Different though they are, an unspeakable childhood incident haunts them both. When the terrible secret comes to light, they are pitted against each other in a race for survival. But can there be a winner when the truth is so dark? Okay. Got one hardback and I had to get this one because look at that cover. Pharaoh. And this is by Valerio Massimo Manfredi. Now it doesn't actually say what it's about on the back, so I will go in and read it. Jerusalem, the Babylonian siege of 586 BC. The kingdom of Judah, Judah is on the verge of annihilation. The Babylonians are destroying the city and enslaving the people. In the chaos, the prophet Jeremiah, escaping through a tunnel, saves the sacred Ark of the Covenant and hides it in a cave in Mount Horeb. He returns frightened and disheveled, having made a discovery that appears to have sent him mad, and then his world disappears. The Middle East, early in the third millennium. Professor William Blake, renowned Egyptologist, has a surprise visit in the middle of the night from representatives of an American mining corporation. They have inadvertently discovered a strange and unusual ancient Egyptian tomb located in a highly sensitive area that risks exploding in the middle... Blah that risks exploding the power to care of Middle Eastern geopolitics. They need his advice on how to excavate the tomb secretly without alerting authorities. Blake finds himself facing the most mysterious case of his life. The tomb is so significant it could belong to a pharaoh, but it lies a thousand miles from the Valley of the King in the Paran Desert, desert where no, an no ancient Egyptian tomb has ever been found before. As he starts to unravel the mystery of this solitary grave, a disturbing theory forms in Blake's mind as the identity of this forgotten pharaoh, a theory that could destroy the balance of the modern world. See, that, that sounds so good. It really does. I, I can't wait. Yeah. Uh, All the Bright Places by Jennifer Niven. I've read Jennifer Niven before. So Theodore Finch wants to take his own life. I'm broken and no one can fix it. Violet Mark is devastated by her sister's death. In that instant we were ploughing, oh, through the guardrail. My words died too. They meet on the ledge of the school bell tower and so their story begins. It's only together they can be themselves. I send a message to Violet. You are all the colours in one at full brightness. You're so weird, Finch, but that's the nicest thing anyone's ever said to me. But as Violet's world grows, Finch begins to sink. How far will Violet go to save the boy she's come to love? That sounds nice. Might be sad. Yeah. I also have New York Valentine by Carmen Reed. Her true love is in London, but her new love is New York. Personal shopper Anne Valentine has a dream job in the heart of man fabulous Manhattan. Daughter Lana is lost in the heat of first love, but has she fallen for a heartbreaker? In London, husband Ed faces a scandal at work and knows in his heart he needs Annie back. What's a girl to do when her true love is in London but her new love is New York? Uh, that'll be a quick read, I reckon. I've got a few by Carmen Reed. I think there's three. The next one is uh, Three in a Bed. Again, Carmen Reed. Bella Browning is attractive, successful and ambitious. She works hard, plays hard and adores her journalist husband, Don, even though she doesn't always behave that way. And yet deep down she knows there's something missing, a baby. When Bella falls pregnant, Don is terrified by the prospect, but Bella's a top management consultant turning around a multi around multi-million pound corporations. She can handle this, can't she? In between bouts of morning sickness, raging hormones and a few indiscretions at the office, Bella quickly discovers how very hard it is to be the perfect working sexy modern mother. I don't know, we'll find out. And what's this? This is The Trial of Lotta Ray by Siobhan McGowan. I, I like this cover. I think this is a really nice cover. And look, 
There's no breaking it on the back. I don't think this book's ever been read. It was 25 pence in the charity shop. On Halloween night, 1906, young working class Lotta Ray is attacked by a wealthy gentleman. She seeks justice at an Old Bailey trial alongside her barrister, William Linden, who she believes to be her ally. The verdict is devastating and Loretta Ray soon realises that the Guardians of Justice do not support her, but what none could foresee were the shocking consequences. Twelve years later, as the suffragettes rise and the ghost of World War I looms large over London, William is joined again by Lotta Ray. Now they travel to a fateful destination where truths must be faced and wrongs will be righted. The day in court is done, but tonight he will hear her testimony. Sounds good. Then about lessons in chemistry, and again, this one I can tell has been read, but the, the, they haven't broken the spine, so it's great. Chemist Elizabeth Zott is not your average woman. In fact, Elizabeth Zott would be the first to point out that there's no such thing. But it's the early 1960s and her all-male team at Hastings Research Institute take a very unscientific view of equality. Forced to resign, she reluctantly signs on as the host of a cooking show, Supper at Six. But a revolutionary approach to cooking, fueled by scientific and rational commentary, grabs the attention of a nation. And soon, a legion of overlooked housewives find themselves daring to change the status quo one molecule at a time. It sounds like a very feminist type story. I know some people don't like the other covers of this, which is just a head and shoulders. Um, but this, this cover seems to be quite popular. I do like this. So I'm looking forward to that one. Then I've got the next Carmen Reed one is Late Night Shopping. Again, I think this is one about the... Annie, yeah, Annie Valentine. An ultra stylish personal shopper, Annie Valentine, is about to learn there are some things the man in your life doesn't need to know. The price of your delicious new handbag and shoes. The fact that you've reached a limit on all your credit cards, you're planning to start a retail business of your own, and there's 500 imported accessories in the spare room. Then there are a few things you may have to mention. You've booked a surprise romantic holiday to Italy, but your relatives are coming too. You seem to have put the house up for sale and a gorgeous Italian has fallen madly in love with you. Could this be one challenge too many for Annie and Ed? Who knows? But we'll find out. The girl with all the gifts. Now this has been around for a while. Again, it was big on TikTok and booktube. So, it's, it, it's the start of it, the way, the way it's written. The, it's, every morning Melanie waits in her cell to be collected for class. When they come for her, Sergeant Parks keeps his gun pointing at her while two of his people strap her into the wheelchair. She thinks they don't like her, she jokes she won't bite, but they don't laugh. So I, I'm intrigued by what it is that she can do. I'm sure I, when I read it I'll find out, obviously. Uh, then I've got another book called She. This is by H.C. Warner. She was meant to be the perfect girl. She's everything he dreamed of, isn't she? Ben can't believe his luck when Bella walks into his life just when he needs her most. Sexy, impulsive and intelligent, Bella is everything he ever wanted and Bella wants him. All to herself. In fact, Bella decides that everything is better when it's just the two of them, making it harder for Ben's fam friends and family to stay in touch. And then a sudden tragedy triggers a chain of events which throws Ben headlong into a nightmare. Secrets, lies, a vengeance and betrayal are at the heart of this utterly twisted story about a family destroyed when she becomes a part of it. Now that sounds my cup of tea. Sydney Sheldon, some of these are from my mum. Uh, are you afraid of the dark? Nothing wrong with Sydney Sheldon. Uh, in New York, Denver, Paris and Berlin, four people have died in what appeared to be random accidents. Ooh. When two women, widows of the dead, find themselves under merciless attack, their fear and confusion help them to form an unlikely alliance. But why are they being targeted? Is there a connection to their husband's mysterious deaths? Meanwhile, the chief executive in an international think tank is on the cusp of a discovery which could change the world and deliver unbelievable power into the company's hands. Could the mysterious deaths be connected to this volatile secret? Mm. And I've got Kate Atkinson, a transcript. I don't know why I picked this up. Uh, maybe, I think this, no, I think this is one of mum's. Because she, uh, my dad gets her books from charity shop at his end of town in Tesco. I get books from the charity shop at this end of town and wherever else I might go. And what happens is we read them and then we swap them. <laughs> and then they go back to the charity shop. It's ultimate recycling. But this one, this one, um, transcription. Oh, I like the Flamingo on the cover. Think of it as an adventure, Perry had said. 
right at the beginning of all this. And it had seemed one, a bit of a lark, she thought, a girl's own adventure. In 1940, 18-year-old Juliet Armstrong is reluctantly recruited into the world of espionage, sent to an obscure department of MI5, tasked with monitoring the comings and goings of British fascist sympathisers. She discovers the work to be by turns both tedious and terrifying, but after the war has ended, she presumes the events of those years have been relegated to the past forever. Ten years later, now a producer at the BBC, Juliet is unexpectedly confronted by figures from her past and a different war is being fought now on a different battleground. But Juliet finds herself once more under threat. A bill of reckoning is due and she finally begins to realise there's no action without consequence. Mmm. There are books everywhere. <laughs> oh, three more to go. Right, next one is a friend request. Maria wants to be friends, but Maria is dead, isn't she? This is by Laura Marshall. I, thought, I think that's why it sounded interesting. Maria Weston wants to be friends with me. Maybe that had been the problem all along. Maria Weston had wanted to be friends with me, but I let her down. She's been hovering at the edges of my consciousness for all of my adult life, although I've been good at keeping her out. Just a blurred shadow in the corner of my eye. Almost, but not quite out of sight. Maria Weston wants to be friends. But Maria Weston has been dead for more than 25 years. Oh, doesn't that sound good? I think that's going to have to come quite to, quite to the top. They all do. They're all really good. Um, a couple of cosy ones now. The Boathouse in Stepping Stone Bay by Helen Rolfe. As a kid, Nina O'Brien spent all of her summers at her grandparents' cabin by the beach at Stepping Stone Bay. Long sunny days full of fun and laughter with her best friends, Leo, Adrian and Maeve. Her friendship with Leo slowly blossoming into love until one fateful night changed everything for them all. And Twelve years later, Nina must return to the bay to renovate the old cabin and pass it on to a new owner. But not only does Leo still live in the cabin next door, he works at his family's boathouse right there in the bay. As they begin to work through their differences and what happened all those years ago, can Nina really walk away from him twice? Maeve has finally returned home to face the past. Her 11-year-old son Jonah loves the sea, unlike Maeve, who is terrified, terrified of it. But she knows she can't keep Jonah away from the sea or the truth forever. I think I probably know what's happened in that one. <laughs> but you never know. And the last one is Miracle at Macy's by Lynn Marie Holzman. Obviously the original owner got this in the works. That was back in the day when they were three for five. They've gone up to three for six now, but still two pound book is cheap. And on this one, it says, Hudson the dog is taking matters into his own paws this Christmas. <laughs> Shy home buddy Charlotte is planning her usual turkey dinner for two for her and her beloved pet dog, Hudson. Only this year, Hudson decides to give his favorite human a holiday adventure she'll never forget. When Hudson runs away the week before Christmas, Charlotte is devastated. She'd rescued him from the trash years before and gave him a place in her home and her heart. But with the help of uptight Englishman Henry, they end up on a magical treasure hunt to find Charlotte's furry four-legged bestie. Spotted in Central Park, glimpse of a wagon tail in Macy's or last seen in Times Square, Hudson leads Charlotte and Henry on a very merry dance around the Big Apple, where love, or should that be Christmas, actually is all around. So there you go. There are all the books I got in October. There will be another one uh, at the end of November because I've already got a bag full of 25p bargains from the charity shop. Ooh, ooh. Some from my mum. Ooh, ooh. And one day I will read them all. Do you think? Do you think I'll ever read them all? I'm going to try. So which one do you think sounds interesting? Which one should I read first? Let me know in the comments below if you made it this far which book you think I should read first and I'll pull it off the list and start reading. I'll see you soon. Bye!